everybody, welcome back to another episode of Card Talk, a podcast where we spend just a little bit of time talking about new player stuff and phases of the game uh, about Lord of the Rings, the card game. I'm your host, Dave Walsh. And I'm Ted Manick, and I love talking about new player things. New player stuff things. And st- <laughs> things and stuff for new players. I feel like that should be a card. Theme. Things and stuff? Things and stuff. Uh, yeah, there's cards related to things and stuff. Right. Most, you know, if you count smoking and eating as things and stuff, right. then there are cards <laughs> for that. Uh, anyways. But uh, we got a uh, fantastic episode for you today, a part of our new player February series. Mm-hmm. We're going to be talking about, just a sneak preview here, we're going to be continuing our series, uh, explaining to new players uh, and veteran players alike, just going through the game phase by phase, talking about the details and sort of uh, rules with those phases. And we're going to be covering the fourth phase of the game, which is travel, and the fifth phase of the game in today's episode, which is going to be the engagement phase or um, encounter phase, as it's That's, called by the rule. Right, the encounter phase. So, you know, normally we do in player. Um, sorry, normally we we have uh, in depth player card analysis here at Card Talk, uh, but every February we put out an extravaganza month where we kind of put our normal content in normal format on hold to give. At like a, a show, um, a lot of shows about one particular topic. So this year, we're, we would be remiss as a podcast in the community to not be addressing the revised core set that uh, is hopefully available in stores right now. Um, but we're also going to use this time to ask for your support. Um, you know, Card Talk, we love, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, that's kind of where we like to um, uh, show everybody what we do. Uh, you know, we have video episodes for all our shows. And if you want to comment, subscribe, hit the notification button over there. We would love that. Um, if you are into our audio podcast side, you can like, subscribe, and uh, rate us, uh, review. And let me make sure I say this correctly for for the audio side. Um, let's see, uh, rate, review, and uh, subscribe to our podcast. There, uh, that helps push the algorithm. I think, as Ted would say, um, <laughs> to feed me. Yeah, to push us up um. so that new players know that there's there's content about the game. Uh, we also have a blog uh, that pumps out articles about the game, uh, about player cards, um, just as often as the as the podcast comes out. So you can always subscribe to the blog uh, and get notified when things happen over there. And then, lastly, kind of the the ultimate in showing support is to uh, to join us on patreon so you can give us a couple of bucks every month and that's that helps us cover the show helps us put out new content helps us in giveaways helps us prizes um helps us for swag so all of that stuff that that um that we love to do for the community so if you are interested in becoming a patron join us over at patreon.com slash card talk 2018 um but despite all of the things that we are asking for uh, from you, uh, we thought that we would provide you with some really good content about the travel phase and encounter phase. So, Ted, I guess the travel phase is has always been uh, rightly, I, I will say this, rightly pegged as the, like the most boring phase in the game. There's not really much that happens there. We, there's some triggers and things like that, but... Um, when I when I look at the theme of what the travel phase is, it, it is what it says it is. It's where the players get together and decide like where they want to go next in Middle Earth, what kind of thing, what place they want to go in order to tackle the next threats that are coming at them from the encounter deck. And you always have to travel to locations. So locations come off in the staging area. There's you know there's no um, there's no treacheries that you travel to. There's no um, enemies that you travel to you always travel to locations so this is the way that you kind of uh, mitigate locations from piling up in the staging area um, is by deciding as your is your your party of travelers to go to these these far off places in middle earth so <laughs> yeah. adventurers yes Adve- um, what the, i said travelers <laughs> they could be travelers yeah. can't they they are no they, they are in this they're phase traveling. they're travelers right? Tra- they're travelers <laughs> there's no adventure right. phase in this game ted <laughs> yeah. 
Go um, ahead. <laughs> so yeah, basically the the travel phase begins and you have an option to travel. So this is one of the decision points of the game where it is it's optional if you want to choose to make a location active. And we're going to discuss what that means and sort of the, the advantages and disadvantages. So as David mentioned, the first advantage of traveling to a location is you are going to make that location active. It sets it aside next to the quest deck and it does a couple of things. The first thing is it removes it from the staging area, which means that the threat of the active location does not count against your questing during the quest resolution phase of the game um, in the previous phase. So that can help. helps lower the threat. But the, the primary disadvantage of that is that that location, you've, you've, you're traveling there, it is going to now act as a buffer. So each location card is going to not only have a threat value, but it's going to have a quest point value, sort of somewhere in the middle of the card. And that number ranges anywhere from one, two, three, four, five, six, any number. And any future progress that you make in this next turn or subsequent turns, that progress that you make from questing successfully will now go on to the active location instead of the main quest. It's sort of like a, a diversion. You're spending your, your time there and it's a buffer between any progress made fra, from yourself and the active, uh, the main quest goes to the active location. Right. And uh, to keep talking about that, the active location stays in the active location slot uh, unless you have a card effect that moves it from there. So it doesn't return to the staging area um, at the end of the turn or anything. So that way, as Ted said, it always it stays there and it's a way of removing threat from the staging area and kind of being able to handle it a different way. Mm -hmm. So the... Uh... The important thing to note, it's a couple things to note, is first of all, a location may have a travel effect on that card. And what a travel effect is, it'll just say travel in bold. And if it has a travel effect, you have to complete the resolution of the travel effect before that location actually becomes active. It's sort of like a prerequisite task you have to do beforehand. Yeah, and I, this is my own experience with this is uh, on Necromancer's Pass. I don't know if that's the card you were thinking of, Ted, but mm -hmm. Necromancer's Pratt Pass has a travel effect that says the first player must discard two cards from his hand at random to travel here, and that's and that's bad. So, um, but it, I've had times when I've only had one card in my hand, so I just discard the one card and say, well, that's the best I could do, and now I'm going to travel to Necromancer's Pass. Lo and behold, no, no, no. It says mm. you must discard two. It doesn't say discard up to two cards. So because it says must, that's the travel. You have to do that in order to travel there. That's the cost of traveling there. That's the penalty that Sauron is making you pay for going to the Necromancer's Pass. It's, it's a treacherous path to tread. Right. David. And so if you can't discard two cards, you cannot travel there. You do not pass shall go. not travel. Do not collect $200. Now, the good thing is, is not every card has a travel effect. And I would say mm -hmm. not even a lot of cards have a travel effect. Um, you know, Mountains yeah, of Mirkwood. But there are some cards that have forced effects that you must read before... Um, <laughs> before yeah. you do them like the east sort of this phase and i thought actually this yeah. is, it's a major decision point actually is really what it boils down to there's a lot right. of thinking and things you have to take into effect right well um, the east bite has the has the you must travel there right when faced with the option to travel you mm -hmm. must travel there so there are some triggers that cause you to travel that you don't have a choice about so again the biggest thing that Ted and I are going to say is, you know, make sure you're reading the cards and become familiar with the cards so that you can, you you know, you know what's going on. Uh, and so you don't miss a, what we call a trigger, right? Something like this happens. Yeah, because that East Bite card, that's just a, a passive. That text is always on. It's always passive. 
And when you have presented with this option, it's sort of taking the option and choice away from you. And that's sort of the power in the card. Um, and then you have to keep in mind travel effects and deciding if you want to pay those to make that location um, the active location. And if neither of any of those things are present, then you could choose to go to no location. Traveling is, unless you're forced to, via some card effect is completely optional so if you decide you don't want to put a buffer strategically between your willpower and progress in the quest then you don't have to correct and um i mean there's reasons to do that and then there's reasons not to do that too so and i will say because in the last episode i did say that there's no there's no phases that are optional the travel phase is not optional the choice to travel is optional, but the phase is not. Another so, important distinction. You know, like, so <laughs> so you can't just skip the travel <sighs> phase, right? So it's about the choice to travel. You have the choice to travel at this point. You can do yeah. it or not. And the reason that comes into play is because certain locations, if you're reading all the cards, which should be, they sometimes impose a penalty or or a bonus, when traveling to the location. So a penalty location, for example, is Enchanted Stream. Mm -hmm. Enchanted Stream is a location that says when it's active, players cannot draw cards. Period. That's it. You <laughs> and, just you just cannot draw cards. And that word cannot is absolute. <laughs> it doesn't if you're trying to Barivore, you cannot use Barivore to draw cards because you right. just cannot draw cards. No hero actions, no events. That means if Enchanted Stream is active during your next turn, you don't get to draw a card during the resource phase when you normally would because you just, it's, that's it. No cards. No, no cards. cards. So right. you might decide that, you know, okay, I have one location in the staging area. It's Enchanted Stream. Do I want to continue to draw cards or do I want to get rid of that location? You have to make that right. decision point. Right. So if it and stays in the... Decide, if it stays in the in the staging area and you choose not to travel to it, that's we usually call that we're going to have to quest over that card for the for the game, you know, like because it's going to contribute its threat still as long as it's in the staging area. Mm -hmm. But then there's cards like Forest Gate that, after you travel to the Forest Gate, you can draw two cards. Like there's positive travel, uh, positive uh, effects as well that happen sometimes with locations. So make sure right. you're reading See the locations for the for the proper thing yeah so it's a big decision point in the game uh and something something i'll kind of present here david let's say you and i are doing this passage to mirkwood play example that we used in a few other videos uh for this series what if there's two locations on the board and i want to go to forest gate because i'm the first player and that would let me draw cards <laughs> right. but but i, I want to you... go to enchanted stream so nobody can draw cards at all. Right. What do we do in that scenario? Well, so when there's an option, when there's a when there's a decision point, the first player kind of holds the 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 be all and end all. So it's always what the first player decides to do. Now, typically in in all the years that I've ever played the game, I've never had I've never come to an impasse at this point where, you know, cuz by the time you get done talking about never it, like, come to a, a fork in the road. Yeah. <laughs> Look at you playing Passage Through Mirkwood Stage 2B on the quest card. Um, but, you know, like, you just, you talk to your, your fellow players and you decide, you know, which one makes the most amount of sense. And that's, and, and you know, some players are adamant that they want to go to the Forest Gate instead of the Enchanted Stream. And, you know, and but ultimately the first player is the one who gets to make those decisions. Yeah, if there's a tie, first player gets sort of the tiebreaker. Hopefully that this is a cooperative game when you're playing with people that uh, right. are amenable. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. Hopefully you're not playing with people you don't like. <laughs> you yeah. Know, like, <laughs> um, but it, 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 it happens. You might have a, you know, and say, well, and that'll happen. Sometimes I'll be playing and I'll say, well, there, there's a there's a scenario for this. There's a reason to go to this location, but there's also an equally good reason to go to this location. And if I'm not the first player, I kind of throw it out to the group and I say, well, you know what? I think this, both are options. But let's say, you know what? First player, it is your decision because there's there's good reasons or bad reasons for both. 
And I guess that's, you know, that's the way it works is that, you know, mm-hmm. when you're playing a cooperative game, I think that the, the creators of the game designed this game to have a lot of decision points to promote discussion about stuff. And even though traveling is pretty boring functionally, it still creates a decision point, which creates a lot of discussion around it. Yeah. So I'd some... say if you're playing uh, solo, right, there's sort of less of an impact. I've had it's so many person. discussions with myself about this. It's <laughs> Well, plus when you're playing solo, you're revealing less cards from the encounter deck during the, during the, um, during the quest phase. So you have less options, lo- less from. locations and options to choose from. So you're not arguing with yourself as much. But when you're playing four player and you have a lot of locations, then there's a lot of discussion going on because you can only travel to one location a turn. And so you may be revealing and two or three locations per round in the staging step from previous. So there's a lot of decision points to be made at, uh, at larger player counts. Yeah, and I'll just go to note also that there can only be one active location, and that can't be changed or swapped out. So there's one active location that Dave and I choose to go to. We cannot next turn, if that location is still active, we cannot just choose to go to a new one. We can't just put that one back in the staging area and swap it out. Um, And there can only be... We're stuck there. We're, we've committed to going there. And there also can only be one at a time. So if more locations come out, we cannot just keep going to locations and have them all active at the same time. There's a limit of one. You can go to a place and then you're there until you leave. So, <laughs> See, Ted, important thing it, 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 to it, it, keep in mind. And I was saying maybe we should put the travel phase as one video and then you're like, ah, travel phase, it's short. You know, 18 minutes <laughs> later, we're going to be doing, now we well, go to the encounter phase. <laughs> if It's really interesting because if, if you look at it in the rule book, it probably has the shortest description. It just says like, you can go to one active location, it acts as a buffer. There's like the least going on there. But, and that's true functionally too. Functionally, yeah. but it has a, a wide impact, I'd say, in the game because those locations affect if you have to discard cards, if you have to engage enemies, if you have to uh, raise your threats, there's right. different Take damage. There's penalties. all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Not draw cards. That's a big deal. Right. <laughs> if you cannot draw cards. I know. So you have to decide um, how you're going to, how you're going to deal with that. Yeah. So now, so do we, uh, do we take our, oh. take this back and do we, uh, do we go back to separating this out into two videos or do we, plug do we plug on and do the encounter phase i think we'll we'll we'll, we'll plug on we'll okay plug on. well okay we'll just, we'll i can't going. i can't talk you out of it okay <laughs> <laughs> just kidding okay so that's the the, the, the travel phase is the fourth phase Almost. of the game right yes yeah and to wrap it up after you've traveled and made this decision point there is an action window <laughs> um and there are travel actions in the game there may be there are there are there are, yeah, there are there travel are. actions, um, cards that specifically say travel actions. I'm not aware of any in the core set. Um, I'm mm-hmm. not aware of any on the you know b- boons and burdens that um, I know about. So, but there are travel actions um, on other cards. But uh, uh, but yeah, I, if there's some sort of travel action that you think you want to make, uh, this may be the time to do yeah. it. Yeah, and it, it could be any other action. Too. Yeah, so it, it could be, be a, you could take an event and put an event into play or right you could use bear Vor's hero ability as an action to exhaust or draw two cards if you want more cards for the upcoming phase which is going to be engagement yep okay so what about the engagement phase which is now the fifth phase in the game yep and, so and probably you... should have been a separate video from this one i'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding Ted. never gonna leave this one down no no no, one no, down. no 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 uh, so the the encounter phase we keep we keep alternating with engagement because engagement is the term you use to decide which enemies are going to be fighting you and which enemies are attacking a certain player uh but the rule book defines it as the encounter phase but i so frequently just call it the engagement phase. right it's like the encounter phase oh there's an enemy the engagement phase now i'm gonna attack it <laughs> you know like, yeah <laughs> but 
anyways. And so the yeah, encounter so phase is, that's what I would say thematically. This is where you have kind of, you know, you, you have the staging area, you kind of know what's out there, and now you're making the decision as your group of adventurers, your group of in- engagers, encounterers, <laughs> are going to decide what they want to tackle in terms of combating this time. This is not the combat phase. It's separate. It's its own phase. And so now, but this is where you make that decision to decide what you're going to kind of uh, a fight. Uh, you've mm-hmm. kind of dealt with all the location stuff, and now it's the fighting time. Yeah. So the first thing that happens is what's called optional engagements. So this begins with the first player. The first player has the ability to basically start and pick a fight with any one enemy in the staging area. And um, unless there's some special rule or passive text that says the enemy cannot be optionally engaged, which there are in the core set, um, specifically in the, at least in the second scenario, maybe possibly in the third one. Right. So the goblin sniper cannot be optionally engaged. So that means that right. you cannot optionally engage this guy. You cannot choose for this guy to come down if there are yep. other enemies in the staging area. So having two goblin snipers in the staging area is Deadly. bad because they're not they're their own separate cards. You know, even though they're the same card, they're still two you know, they're looking at each other as separate enemies. So Yeah. It's uh it can get out of hand, uh, this phase. So you have to you really have to factor in there's a lot of planning here to do, especially if you're playing with uh, two, three, four players about which enemies you're going to fight. But we'll just sort of take it through uh, step by step in the rule books. The first one is optional engagement. The first player has the ability to pick any one enemy in the staging area. You cannot pick an enemy that's engaged with somebody already, maybe a previous turn. And you take that enemy from the staging area, you put it into your player area, uh, usually in front of your heroes. And the enemy will now be attacking you during the combat phase and you'll be able to attack it uh, back afterwards. This yeah. then proceeds in, in player order. Uh, so after I had my option, I, I could choose one enemy, or I could choose none and say, I don't want to fight anything extra. I want to leave that enemy or leave those enemies in the staging area. Then it goes to David's turn. He can do the same thing. He can choose one enemy in the staging or not. And when you're playing solo, it's pretty straightforward because you're the only player there. But as Ted said, I will say when you're playing multiplayer, just to highlight, you have to make sure you go in in player order, starting with the first player. Optional engagements, you choose and you start with player one, and then you go all the way around the table for however many players you're playing. And if, if people choose or not choose to engage, that's good, but you can't go back and then optionally choose late, like the player player one doesn't have a second chance to do that so you have to make sure that you talk it out figure out what you want to do and then optionally engage correctly in a multiplayer game uh yeah so once you've decided and and your decision point at this game is sort of determined by the next step uh of (laughs) like that follows it but before I get into that, I'll make a note of guess what, David? Um, is there an action window here, Ted? There is an action window here. Right. So after the optional engagement phase, there's an action window sort of before normal engagement checks. Um, it, it doesn't let you, you know, make any sort of attacks or do anything like that because we're not in the combat phase. But there's an action window again to maybe maybe draw cards or to do something to an enemy. Um Again, there's there's some cards that let you like boost hero stats, but those you want to play during the actual combat phase. This is just the encounter phase where you're sort of, you know, you're picking which enemies you're going to fight, and some enemies are picking to fight you based on the rules coming up, which are the engagement checks. And so this is kind Engage- of the, the meat and the bread and butter of how enemies are really going to come down and and destroy your world right so this this is the time where you don't have a choice right and so this is the enemy is out there and and that enemy is going to attack you like you can't do anything about it 
Yeah, I will actually for this part. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to read a piece of the rule book because I, I think it's it's pretty clearly explained here. Um, it says the first player compares his threat level against the engagement cost of each of the enemy cards in the staging area. The enemy with the highest engagement cost that is equal to or lower than that player's threat level engages this player. And then you move it from the staging area to the space in front of you, and that's what's called an engagement check. And then uh, once this is done, it again continues in player order. So I would make my check first, comparing my threat. Uh, so for example, if I have a 25 threat and there is a dual Gul'dor orcs in the staging area, which has a uh, threat or a threat value, an engagement cost of 10, uh, because my my 25 threat value is equal to or, or higher, right? The enemy's is, is equal to or lower mine. That enemy just fights me. It comes down and engages me. There's nothing I can do about it. If that enemy's there and I'm first player, uh, that just happens. That's the only, okay. that's the only enemy I should so say. So question, Ted. So mm -hmm. same scenario. You have 25 threat. The Dolgador yep. orcs have 10 engagement cost. But also yep. the wargs have 20 engagement cost. Which one do you okay. have to engage? So Because you only engage read, one enemy, right? No. No. So what would happen is, let's say there, let's say in this example we have two enemies. We have a wargs of engagement 20 and the orcs of engagement 10. As the rulebook states, me as first player, I would check the highest enemies first. So that would be the wargs at 20. Right. So I look at the wargs at 20 and say, oh, 20 is less than my 25. The wargs, uh, they check against me. They pass their engagement check, however you want to word it. Right. And they will pull down in front of my player area. Then it's going to go over to you, David, being uh, second and last player. And if your threat is... 30 right 28 <laughs> right 30 right 28 right uh again those orcs that that 10 is less than your 28 or 30 and so then the orcs are going to come down to you and this systematically continues for each player mm -hmm. and for each enemy so if right. there was a th if there was a third enemy in this example and only two players it rotates back again to the first player right which would be and neat. that's what i was getting at is that you do engagement checks one at a time you yes. check your threat against the highest threat enemy in the staging area. If that enemy checks, you engage. And then it goes to player two. Player two checks his threat against the highest threat cost enemy in the staging area. If that enemy checks, they engage. And then it goes and then back they have to player a wonderful one. Wonderful wedding in Lothlorien right. and live happily <laughs> right. ever right. after. <laughs> and so, so it's it's about again, it's about making sure you do the things incrementally. Because I I play multiplayer and multiplayer, or I normally play solo. And when I do play multiplayer, I sometimes screw up the engagement checks because I'm so used to not having to worry about engaging them one at a time per the rules, right? And so, and then you reflect back on your optional engagement. Maybe this is where you want to talk about this or where we bring this up. So it may behoove you to optionally engage those lower threat cost enemies to prevent them from engaging other people, if that makes sense. So if I have a Dolgledore orcs and I don't want Ted to have to engage them, because he will have to engage them. I can optionally engage them before Ted even has a chance to engage them um, during the engagement check phase. I can option them in the previous step and take them out of the staging area. So that's that's all part of the decision points of the game. Is And that's, again, it creates these points where you're talking about what we need to do, how we need to engage these enemies to make sure that they are going to, you know, that we're going to not die, basically. Yeah, it's, 
it's it's all the phases are really you take it step by step but you have to sort of think about phases ahead as you as you plan for them and take action as you do the planning phase you got to think about questing and as you quest you got to think about travel and as you engage enemies you got to think about combat and then the next turn and uh so it all it all plays into each other and uh, sort of adds a couple layers to the game about the thought process, and what's really makes it appealing, I think, to a lot of the people who uh, play and have stuck with the game for yeah, it's and, been out. And a couple of things to keep in mind is some of the encounter cards will have engagement um, bonuses or will um, do something once it engages you. For example, the forest spider. You know, once it engages you, it gets plus one attack for the rest of the round. So. You know, you have to make sure that you do that, that you follow through on that when it engages you. So after it goes from the staging area to somebody's play area, that force spider is going to get an extra attack until the end of the round. At the end of the round, it evaporates. But until the end of the round, which is now the engagement and then eventually combat. So... Or how about them uh, them Hummer horns? <laughs> yeah, the Hummer horns. You hardly have any chance with the Hummer horns. <laughs> so the Hummer horns, uh, just after you engage them, it deals five damage to some enemy, a, her- a, a hero, hero. Sorry, some hero you control. Yeah. So for the core set, that's every enemy will will die naturally. Like, uh, well, every every. I'm sorry. No every hero, hero had- right? has more than five hit points uh and there's no way to expand that or make it bigger there's no way to prevent that damage so that hummer horns will essentially if you only have the core set if you're forced to engage it uh it has a higher engagement cost of 40 but if that happens a hero will die right the only thing the only thing you can do is while well, there's a couple of there's a couple of tricks and like things you, you can, can have yeah. citadel plate on some enemy or some hero and that that will increase oh, the hit points. Oh, point. that's true. Yeah, that's right. You can there is actually one card to increase hit points in the core set and it's citadel plate, which yep. gives you plus four hit points. You can see our show on Silly citadel me. plate. Um and then um you can use Gandalf. Gandalf's um passive effect when he comes into play does four damage to an enemy somewhere. And so you can Gandalf can evaporate the Hummer horns. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of tools to get rid of it and actually deal with it. Right. Uh, the hero Dune here as well. Right. Dune here uh, will also. You can see our shows on all of those cards. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, but that's that's pretty much uh, in engagements. So you make the engagement checks. Um, I will. I will make an. My favorite note to make is that after you finish with engagement checks entirely, there is another action window right before you jump into the combat phase, uh, which I'm trying to think of something in the course that lets you do something against an enemy, like not during that would, because there's probably not a lot of things you can do, but there is an action window where if you could affect some enemy, uh, you can do it now, but again, it's going to be limited to actions on heroes and event cards. You can't play any attachments. You can't play any allies. You're restricted to actions here still in the action window. Yeah. Yep. So I think that's it. I mean, there's a lot there, even though the, you know, functionally, these are two, I said it with the travel phase, these are two of the shorter phases in terms of time. Um, but there's a lot of decision points there trying to get you to talk with your player, you know, talk with the people you're playing with and, you know, just to, to make those good decisions about how you're going to tackle the game. So, you know, I, <laughs> you spend a lot of time talking to make sure that uh, you can <laughs> you can you can do things correctly only yeah. to be thwarted by the encounter deck anyways because there's another you know there's not just staging which is a way that the encounter deck keeps up but then there's also in the next phase after this is foreshadowing there's also shadow cards which is another way for the encounter deck to keep up with you so it's a pain in the neck so is there any last gasps here about these two phases ted uh no i think we summed it all up they are short rules wise but they impact your turn and they impact your turns going forward so 
just uh, keep reading each card. Make sure you, you know, note the travel effects. You note the engagement effects of enemies. Um, note if there's any passive effects for things being in the staging area, sometimes locations. Being in the staging area, you just got to read those cards. Make sure you're making decisions because you have all the information in front of you. Yep. And that's it. Okay. Well, there you have some expert advice on both the travel and encounter phases. So join us again as we talk about more phases in the game. Have a great day, everybody. Do you love the content? Here's what you can do to stay connected. Become a patron. The money collected through Patreon goes into keeping the lights on here at the podcast. We love our patrons and you can join at many different levels. Visit patreon.com slash card talk 2018. You can subscribe to us, whether you're watching our YouTube channel or you're listening to us in your favorite podcatcher. Hit the subscribe button to get notifications of all our new episodes. Didn't know we were an audio podcast? Find us by searching Card Talk to get access to our 120 plus regular episodes. Didn't know we were a video channel? Find us by searching Card Talk L-O-T-R L-C-G on YouTube and there you can find not only our regular episodes, but you can find our bonus playthroughs and other content related to the game. Want to get a hold of Ted, Grant, or myself? Feel free to email the podcast at cardtalk2018 at gmail.com.